This last session is a panel on resettlement, and uh, I'm delighted to introduce the three speakers. Uh, Rita Chahal, who is here from Winnipeg, who's the executive director of the Manitoba Interfaith Immigration Council, and Rita will speak first. Uh, then Martin Zog, who is uh, the executive director of the LA Office of the International Rescue Committee, and Megan Taylor, then executive director of Interfaith Refugee and Immigration Service, a unit of the Episcopal Diocese of Los, Los Angeles. So every speaker will talk for roughly 20 minutes, uh, and then we will segue to question and answer with the audience. Okay, Rita. Well, first of all, thank you. Is this on? No. I don't think it's on. How did it go off? Wasn't it on a second ago? Oh, did it come out again? Yeah. Okay. No? no. Yes. Can you hear me? No. no. So if we just swing it. Oh, the switch. Ah. Okay. Just a second. Okay, technical challenges at the end of the day. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this inv invitation. We're, we're absolutely delighted to be here, and especially as part of the Canadian contingent uh, to share with you some of our models. Um, a lot of what I have uh, have um, uh, that I had planned to say has already been stated, so I'm not going to take a lot of, lot of your time because it is Friday afternoon, uh, 4 o'clock, and I know we're all anxious to get home. Um, but, um, but I think it is important to, to uh, look at some of the Canadian very specific models, as Jean-Marc said. We're one of the service providers in Manitoba uh, in the country that um, uh, does this work that the government funds us for. So I may skip through a few things, and I hope that when we have a chance to answer questions, we'll cover some of those. Uh, you know, basically we're um, one of the, I'm just gonna skip into that. Uh, we are a Manitoba Interfaith Immigration Council, as the name suggests. Um, we are governed by a, um, an interfaith board, and we are Manitoba's largest uh, refugee settlement agency. Uh, we welcome and assist refugee newcomers from all around the world. I have a little pamphlet and a brochure about us if anybody's interested in, in, in seeing this a little bit later as, as our annual report. We basically uh, provide uh, temporary accommodation to newly arrived government assisted refugees and we have a reception house. A major focus of that um, uh, temporary accommodation is to keep them there for about three weeks and then transition into more permanent housing. Uh, we also provide uh, life skill assistance to refugees and to their families as they arrive in Manitoba. And at the end of the day, our real focus is to ensure that people um, become uh, empowered to become self-sufficient as quickly as possible so they're not a dependency on the systems or, or on, on, on agencies like ours to continue being supported. So we really, really try to work very, very quickly into that. Um, I won't get into the, the three uh, major classifications because John Mark has already done that, but those are the groups that we work with. The government-assisted refugees, the privately-sponsored refugees, um, and the other um, group that we work closely with is the refugee claimant. And Mark, Jean Marc didn't go into the details, and, but right now there isn't um, an interest in, in that. In terms of my presentation, I'm, I am giving you a very um, Coles version notes, and I'm sp uh, going to specifically talk about how the Manitoba model was different in, than the other parts of the country uh, the, throughout the Syrian response. And then, which is not part of my formal presentation, I'm, I am going to talk a little bit about the refugee claimant because of the interest uh, in, in that, in, in that uh, situation right now. So I may go a little bit longer than 20 minutes, if that's okay. Our basic services uh, are very similar to what John Mark talked about, the reception services. We are a reception service um, center, but we are also um, um, a, an agreement holder on a number of other things. So there are really three agreements that we have with the, with the federal government. One is the, for, for the government assisted is the GARS, which is a three, uh, uh, the RAP services, which uh, is about a three, uh, about a six week period during which we provide some very basic um, orientation and settlement, temporary accommodation, move, transition people into their, into their permanent housing. 
Uh, we have then a long-term uh, settlement contract with the federal government, which looks into the whole year of settlement process as people transition into more long-term needs, whether it's looking after their language needs or um, uh, training, those kinds of things, a bit more long-term. Um, and then the third agreement that we have is with our, we are a sponsorship agreement holder. We're one of the largest in Canada, we're certainly the largest in Manitoba. And as part of our um, uh, sponsorship agreement holder, we are, um, uh, we have about 92 uh, constituent groups that we work with uh, to privately sponsor people. Now all of these contracts that we have collectively provide the following services, which is reception services, settlement, life skills. And settlement and life skills, if there's a way I can describe that is that the settlement service is sort of the, the theoretical piece, you know, we do the orientations, we, we do tell them what the laws of the country are, how to get, you know, what are the things that have to be done. And the life skill training is the practical part. So for as, as an example, we might show them, tell them about um, the importance of uh, taking care of your apartment, right? You know, you, there's laws about fire regulations and things like that. But the life skill trainer will actually go to the home of, uh, uh, of, a, of a new client and actually go through the whole process. How do you take care of, uh, you know, how do you work with the, with the appliances? What are some of the uh, regulations around fire codes? How do you use the telephone system? Some very basic things that you and I would, would take for granted, but this is part of our life skills uh, program. Um, we also, you know, as soon as people arrive uh, at the airport, we ensure that we give them service in their first language. As I said earlier, we, uh, we have about 30, minimally 30 languages that we provide service, first language. Um, and uh, we try to keep those, the same counselor working with a client from the moment that they arrive at the airport to by the end of the year, first year, that they can transition into more independence. Um, we do continue giving service to people until they are uh, Canadian citizens. So once they become a Canadian citizen, they are no longer eligible for, for um, uh, services. Um, to augment some of these uh, basic um, uh, wrap and settlement services, we also have other uh, services that we provide, which uh, um, a lot of them come under the volunteer services. Um, these would be things like our breakfast program for the children that live in the, in the residence, would be art classes, computer classes, conversational English, um, uh, social activities for, for our clients, you know, things like Christmas parties, taking them on, on outings, engaging them for movie night for the, for the residents while they're in with us. So a lot of them, again, I'm not gonna get into a lot of the details that would, that would take about half an hour for each of these programs and themselves to talk about it. Um, the sponsorship service is an important part of our, our service delivery. It is not one that is funded by any level of government uh, at the moment. There has been, um, uh, you know, some funding for that in previous times uh, by the provincial government, but at the moment we are continuing to do our own fundraising uh, to support that program. Uh, the volunteer service is also another program that is not funded by the federal government, but it augments um, the, the, the services that are delivered by, through our settlement and our RAP program. Our In Canada Protection Program is one that is absolutely not supported by any level of government. Um, uh, <laughs> there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, but we, again, recently, uh, the provincial government, because of the influx, and I'll talk a little bit about it towards the end, uh, of the uh, border crossings, the provincial government has uh, committed to um, uh, about $110,000, which is really a drop in the bucket. Uh, but we're very grateful that that is there. Um, to, to support the work of our uh, In Canada Protection Program. Uh, but they've also committed to uh, uh, 14, um, 14, 17 units, temporary accommodation, when the refugee claimants that are coming through our border have a place to stay. Uh, again, we're continuing to work with uh, other groups um, and, and um, uh, to ensure that that program uh, continues to be uh, funded and, and uh, maintained. We also, for, in, for that particular program, we have support from foundations. The Winnipeg Foundation has been a longtime supporter of ours. Um, and we are doing our own fundraising now to, to, for the sustaining of that program. We have a, a new uh, campaign called openyourhearts.ca. So if anyone's interested in donating, please go mm -hmm. to our website. Um, 
I promised you I would talk a little bit more specifically about the, the model that we had for the Syrian response, um, because it was a little bit unique um, than what, what had happened in other parts of the country. Um, the, the, the Syrian response initiative uh, was announced um, uh, on November uh, 4th, 2015, and technically it went to, um, by the time the 20, uh, 26,000 Syrian refugees were, were brought in uh, to February um, 28th or 29th of 2016. However, the funding for the Syrian response uh, was maintained till June 2016. So it was um, a very um, interesting and uh, very fast-paced uh, environment for us to be working in. Uh, and, and it did, um, there were a lot of lessons learned, and I'll talk a little bit about those at the end. But it also gave us an opportunity to, for the community and the settlement sector to really come together. Of course, as you know you know that there were three centers that people uh, were Syrians were brought from from um, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Um, there were, I think, three flights a day uh, that landed in Montreal and Toronto, uh, and uh, in total there were 99 flights that came, uh, and these were chartered flights. Um, <coughs> and the bulk of it really started in December and went till the end of uh, uh, Feb February 16. Um, a lot of funding was allocated to SPOs like us, and uh, we, whatever we needed, we got. So, I just had to ask for money, and, and they just said, okay, do whatever you need to do. Here, take it. Um, I think the program really worked well in, 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 in Manitoba because um, uh, there was a very much a provincial and federal uh, and, and municipal partnership. There was, um, the, the model that worked in Manitoba was, we were the only province um, in Canada that did not house the Syrian refugees in hotels. And that was very much a political decision. Uh, and it was a directive that was given both by our federal minister at the time, Minister McCollum, and the Premier of Manitoba. And there were, again, as I said, political reasons. So literally on Boxing Day, when we had planned to put the overflow into hotels, because we only had one building to begin with, um, and we were going, you know, I'd even put my credit card down and we had got it all arranged. But I got a call on December the 26th, 2015, and I said, Rita, no one is staying in hotels. Oh, where are we gonna put all these people up? You know, you've got all these people committed to us. We went into a marathon meeting with, uh, with the province and with the federal government through teleconferencing and, and uh, people on site. And the decision was made uh, literally overnight or within a few hours that you know, people were not going to stay in hotels, that the provincial government was going to free up two spaces uh, for us within the next 72 hours. Uh, well, there was only 72 hours left before the first plane load was going to arrive in Manitoba with, with uh, I, think, I, th I think like there was 45 or 50 people that were scheduled to arrive within that. And so we really had to go into um, um, a mode where we had to really work together and not. And there was no room for discussion. When the minister and the premier agree on something, you do what, what's necessary. <laughs> However, what, what, what did work well is that um, prior to this directive from the federal and, and the provincial government, the, the settlement sector in Manitoba is very close-knit. And we, in, in preparation for that, we had actually started the process and the mapping before people were going to arrive. So it actually started um, towards the end of November, early December, uh, through the Emergency Measures uh, Office of the provincial government. So we literally, there was a, this, there's a, an actual office called the Command Center. And so we actually, there's computers and there's all kinds of gadgets there. It was really interesting. I should have brought a picture of that, uh, where we would gather every week, sometimes twice a week, um, and the group kept getting bigger and bigger, where we mapped out the process. How were we going to integrate people coming in? How were we going to, first of all, receive them, serve them, and then eventually long-term integrate them? So that process was really good that we had that at the very beginning um, because it really helped us to map out a few things early. 
We also ended up having some short-term agreements uh, uh, at, at all the different levels, whether it was uh, leasing agreements or whether it was um, um, uh, you know, uh, funding agreements. All of those happened very, very quickly. There wasn't a lot of time to, to, to plan around it. Uh, we literally went from one building, which uh, normally houses, um, which we have 30 self-contained units, um, and then after that, it's, um, uh, we added two more buildings. One was an apartments, 25 apartments within an apartment building, and then uh, a third building, which was a, uh, an old building that hadn't, uh, wasn't abandoned, but it hadn't been used for a long time. It was a hostel-like setting. So we had to adjust our uh, service delivery model based on the type of building that we got. So again, a lot of uh, uh, changes very, very quickly. Um, so the, uh, the infrastructure was there, but we had to make it work. We had to make it work very quickly. The financial um, support was there, um, so that helped a lot. Uh, and then we also had to now ad adjust and adapt our staffing model to those three different locations and how, how we were going to serve people. Okay, I'm gonna skip some of the other things I was gonna say. The other thing that really made it, made it work well in Manitoba was the additional supports and partnerships that we, we had. Um, the settlement sector, as I said, became very coordinated at the very beginning and we, we got people engaged. And I've always said this before, um, that while this was an initiative that was very publicly a government initiative and came out, as Jean-Marc said, came out of uh, a lot of um, uh, promises because of the election and things like that, it was a, this was a, a pro project that really belonged to the people of Canada. And it was the Canadian interest, the public interest in, in this that was very, very important. The communities got engaged, the Canadian citizens got engaged. They wanted to do things. They wanted to welcome people. It's just part of being Canadian. Um, and there was a lot of interest in the volu from volunteers. We worked with the Red Cross to manage that process. Um, and people just, we were overwhelmed by the, the amount of support and, and that we got. We were, the phone was ringing off the head hook as well. The other thing, of course, was that internally for within, not just for Manitoba Interfaith, but other agencies that were providing additional services, their internal staff, their boards, their volunteers, no one in my office, no one in my agency ever said no to me for anything that we wanted to do. They just, I just say, go do this, please. And just, just go and do it. No one questioned it. It was they were just focused on getting the work done, and a lot of them ended up working a lot of long hours. I had to pay a lot, but then I had money to do it this time, so we, you know, it was kind of nice. Um, um, but that was great. Um, and of course, the private sector that was an important part of this uh, this uh, success was the private sector got involved. Everything from um, you know uh, the IKEA, for example, buying all these beds and, and linens that we had to buy. IKEA was great. We, we bought them out on, on Boxing Day. There was no furniture left <laughs> at, at IKEA. I mean, I'm sure. <laughs> literally, we bought them all out. And we worked with the Department of Housing, who was supporting us um, for this initi initiative. Uh, we, um, the, the Chamber of Commerce was quite involved. Private sector were giving furniture and things like that, televisions, uh, you name it, they gave. We had to, um, uh, the private sector for things like, you know, um, Haircutting salons and pizza places were raising money for us. So there was, a, again, a lot of, I, I have lots of examples that I could give you, but the local interest was, was there. Um, this is a very complicated slide, and I had an actual whole um, uh, section I was going to read out to you, but I won't. But basically what this uh, uh, show demonstrates is that when the government-assisted refugees arrived, and they're at uh, MIIC is in the middle. These are all of the settlement sector um, agencies that work, that we work directly with and we, we ensure that, c that clients continue to get connected. A number of these that you're seeing around uh, these little round uh, uh, circles actually grew out of a a Manitoba Interfaith when, to begin with um, when the need was there. So I'll move that on. There was um, best practices and, and lessons learned. It was a national lessons learned, um, uh, you know, uh, two-day meeting in Ottawa that we, were, we participated in. But each of us also went back to our provinces and had developed a, 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 a provincial analysis and an agency analysis and, and, and about future direction. So while there were lots of uh, 
good things that came out in the, in the <coughs> lessons learned. Three observations that I can make. Um, need to engage, uh, that, that I think that were important that sort of came out in all three of them, was the need to engage the SBOs early in the process. I think that was one of the things that, that the government fell through on, that didn't engage us enough. There were a lot of political decisions being made and, 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 and uh, things were just happening without engaging them. And so we could have helped with smooth, making things a bit smoother. The other thing that I've learned is that when there's a will, there's a way. Um, and if the dollars are there, things can happen. And so uh, I think those are the things that we wanted. And of course, um, uh, you know, one of the things that, that did come out of this was that um, there was some dissension amongst refugee groups. Reason being, for example, the, the transportation loan. Only the Syrians that traveled between November 4th, okay, between November 4th and um, um, I think uh, March 31st, the transportation loan was waived, and all the other groups, it wasn't waived. So that really caused a lot of um, uh, concern. Um, the refugee claim, I, again, I'm, I'm rushing through this, but I, um, I didn't want to take a, a couple of minutes just to say, I'll take only three minutes, about the refugee claimant situation right now in Manitoba. In a normal year, we would see about 50 to 60 refugee claimants in land protection uh, claims coming through. In just the last three months, and uh, before leaving um, 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 Winnipeg last, uh, on, on Thursday, I got the last numbers that since January to this week, we have had 360. So we have grown exponentially. And these are mostly about, uh, I would say 97% are coming through, through the Emerson border. Um, we've had to up our staff. Um, we don't have money for it, but we are fundraising. And so I've just basically pulled staff from, from uh, other departments uh, that are not funded by IRCC and moved them in there to, to do that. Um, we've developed some partnerships um, uh, to continue enhancing. So for example, we've, we've uh, uh, working with the Salvation Army for temporary housing. Uh, we have, um, of course, an, an agreement with the province both for funding and for temporary accommodations. Um, we're working very closely with the other settlement sector uh, folks that we can uh, move people to. Our basic premise is that we, when we pe get people picked up, uh, when Canadian Border Services calls us and says we've got nine or 10 or 11 people ready to go, you can come down and, and, and pick them up. Our, our whole pro um, pro you know, approach to is treating people with dignity and respect um, and ensuring that they get all the resources that they need to ensure that they can navigate the social and the legal system uh, to get the assistance to have their, um, their um, um, you know, application heard uh, through the refugee board. Um, uh, you know, I, if possible, it may be later in the questions, I can show you some of the documents that people fill, but really it is very much uh, uh, a very time sensitive uh, um, for them because many of the, those applications and paperwork has to be filled in between 24 to 72 hours before even the basis of claim is, is, uh, is submitted, which they have about 15 days to do. We've been working with uh, volunteer law students who've helped us uh, to manage the process a little bit better. And of course, um, continuing to get you know support from places like Winnipeg Foundation. So um, I'm going to end there and hopefully um, uh, answer some more questions about the refugee claimant process right now in Manitoba. So. I, I never have to ask, can you see me? But I will ask if uh, you can hear me. Rita, I, want, I, I just want to let you know that you cannot get a higher endorsement of your program than this. Uh, Megan and I have been doing this work for a long time. And about in the middle of your presentation, she leaned over to me and she said, let's move to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I'm very happy to be here for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, I was a student here a little more than 40 years ago. So to uh, come back, <laughs> to come back when I'm just a little uh, less naive is a very big treat. And the second thing is that you're all here. 
uh, because 40 years ago, if it were a, a beautiful spring, sunny Friday afternoon at 4.30, I would be extreme vetting the happy hours down in Westwood, and, and you're not. So I'm very, I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, I represent the International Rescue Committee. IRC is one of uh, the nine uh, authorized agencies to resettle refugees in this country. Uh, and what I'd like to do today is three things. First, describe the landscape of uh, resettlement here in California and in Los Angeles. Second, talk about some of the challenges we have here. Uh, and one particular challenge we, we uh, haven't quite overcome. And, and last, talk about an innovative way uh, that we have been trying over the last year to, to overcome that challenge. So uh, immigrants have been coming to California for a long time. Uh, uh, those of you who are in California know uh, Father of Unibera and the story of the missions and everything that has taken place in the ensuing centuries. But refugee resettlement as we know it really didn't begin until the mid-70s uh, when large numbers, hundreds of thousands of Southeast Asian refugees uh, came to the West Coast primarily and stayed initially on military bases. Uh, uh, at some point, uh, I know the U.S. Marines had enough of that and they asked the State Department to resettle uh, all of those refugees and that's when IRC and others established their offices in San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco and later uh, Seattle and elsewhere. Right now, there are 24 resettlement agencies in California, uh, either offices or affiliates of those nine national agencies I mentioned. They're concentrated in seven counties, seven refugee-affected counties, they're called, uh, but really in four major metropolitan areas, Sacramento, the Bay Area, San Diego, and here in Los Angeles. Uh, in Los Angeles, there are seven of those 24 resettlement agencies. Uh, and every year, uh, for the last four or five years, together we've averaged resettling about 2,500 re uh, refugees a year. Recently, we've had increases uh, of refugees from Iraq, Afghanistan, they're mostly SIVs, uh, but also from Syria and, and Central America. My, my longtime friend and colleague, Megan Taylor, will talk about the CAM program here in a few minutes. But the overwhelming majority of refugees we resettle here in Southern California come to us through a program uh, called the Lautenberg Program, and they are Iranian refugees. The Lautenberg Program is part of the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. It started back in the early 90s, and it provides the means for persecuted religious minorities in the so former Soviet Union to resettle here as refugees. Uh, along about 2004, that program was amended to permit persecuted religious minorities in Iran that same opportunity. The overwhelming majority of those folks are Armenian Christians you may know Southern California is the center of the Armenian diaspora, which is why our population is mostly Iranians, mostly Armenians, and it is completely unique among refugee populations here in the United States. Among the challenges uh, uh, that we find, uh, and, and when I talk about this, I usually uh, put this out to the audience for guesses, but I won't do that to you. Uh, they're, they're the ones that you all know well in any large metropolitan area. It's the lack of affordable housing, uh, the lack of suitable, suitable employment, uh, the lack here in Los Angeles in particular of public transportation, and unique to Los Angeles, it's simply the scale of the place. We are huge and spread out, which makes resettlement a particular challenge for us. Those seven agencies I, I mentioned are responsible for an incredibly vast area from the central coast 
to the southern central uh, valley, to the border of Nevada and Arizona, down to the border of San Diego County. I don't know what the equivalent state is, but it's a big one. Um, but you know, maybe the, the biggest challenge is just the nature of how we're organized. We're 24 agencies across this really vast state. Uh, and we're all doing the same resettlement program. We all operate under exactly the same cooperative agreement from the State Department. And yet, by and large, we work independently. Uh, I, I, I really hate uh, the jargon from which uh, the word silo derives, but if you want an example of silos, <laughs> come to us. Because we're all working in, in different places doing the same thing, but without, without very much cooperation. So why is all that cooperation and collaboration important? Um, you know, I, I, I was, uh, I really appreciate being sent uh, the, the box connection to all the papers that were uh, being presented at this conference. And I wanna call out one, is, is Molly Fee here? Well, Molly, uh, I read your paper and uh, you somehow you reached into the heart of a resettlement agency and put it on paper. And, uh, and it, it was very gratifying to see someone feel our pain. <laughs> I won't, if you haven't read it yet, I won't spoil it for you, but definitely read it. But basically, she talked about uh, the fact that uh, resettlement agencies are uh, understaffed, under-resourced, and overburdened by accountability measures. And, and that's just the high level, the, the, the dirt is really a lot better than that. Um, because we have little time to do anything that is strictly right in front of us, uh, we really need to maximize that time. So any time we spend solving problems that a, a refugee resettlement agency right down the street maybe has already solved, that's wasted time. And yet we still don't take that time typically to go down the street and ask. So the more that we can share, the more effective we'll be uh, and the greater network of social services we'll have to provide to refugees. Also important is that collaboration opens space for joint advocacy, bringing the power of the several agencies together on an issue of local concern that no one single agency can affect. We're not talking about uh, uh, local agencies here having an impact on uh, congressional appropriations. We're talking about working with a county agency to change a policy that affects refugees in our, in our neighborhood. A really important uh, stuff that we don't do enough of. So if, if collaboration is so important and it's so positive, why don't we do it? Why is it so tough? Well, the first probably is just the sheer number of agencies we have in this state. Uh, 24 agencies. Uh, I don't know if any other state has as many. Texas may, although maybe not for long. Uh, but I, I was in, uh, visiting our uh, Salt Lake office uh, a couple of weeks ago. Salt Lake uh, has two resettlement agencies, but they don't have any trouble collaborating with each other. Uh, Boise uh, has two uh, for the entire state. They used to have three. World Relief just closed their office there. They're not only collaborating, they, they co-locate their offices. They see each other in, in the hallways. Uh, but not us. We have you know, this incredible uh, uh, state in which we are spread out from uh, you know, north of Sacramento to literally to the Mexican border in El Cajon. <coughs> the second, uh, uh, resettlement agents are typically kept busy responding to their own headquarters imperatives. 
So we're trying to serve clients, but we have cooperative agreements, and those cooperative agreements have a lot of demands in them. And, and our headquarters, typically, a lot of wonderful people in headquarters offices, IRC's headquarters are especially nice. <laughs> but they want us to comply with that cooperative agreement, and so there's an enormous imperative to respond to the, the requirements in that document. Third, there are dra drastically different organizational, organizational models even within the several uh, resettlement agencies. So that uh, some are run by uh, uh, tall executive directors <laughs> who have uh, really a lot of authority. I, I'm able to run my office like a business. Uh, and I can make decisions largely on my own. Uh, whereas other resettlement agencies, resettlement is just a tiny part of a larger agency. And so uh, those, those offices are run by middle managers who, who may have no authority and no independence, and they have to actually advocate for refugees within their own agency. So when all, even on those rare occasions when resettlement agencies come together, they don't come together as equals. Uh, and then uh, among even the director-run agencies, there's a wide disparity. And, and the disparity is often in the levels of sophistication in, in running an agency. Many don't know how to do advocacy. They know how to resettle a refugee, and that's it. But that's only a tiny slice of the job. So encouraging their co cooperation and collaboration in advocacy, for instance, and many other things can be a challenge. And then even at the state level, uh, despite California being one of the states resettling the most refugees, statewide coordination, until recently, has been especially weak and ineffective. So uh, what needs to change? Well, the first thing is uh, we've long needed stronger and more co cohesive, uh, a, a more cohesive state coordinating body. And fortunately, over the last 18 months, we've really made a lot of great strides in that regard. Uh, there's been new leadership at the California Department of Social Services, and uh, those leaders have really taken uh, a terrific role in actively engaging resettlement agencies in a way uh, they frankly haven't since the early 80s. Also, the State Advisory Committee for Refugee Services and Assistance, which for many years had been largely ineffective, if not entirely irrelevant, uh, has come back to life. Uh, again, with CDS's support. And while it still has uh, quite a ways to go, it's making steady gains in connecting the state uh, to promote refugee welfare. And then on the local level, refugee forums. There's, there's a refugee forum in each of the seven refugee-affected counties in the state. And they're improving, although that, frankly, is much harder to measure. And there's still wide disparity about their effectiveness. But here in Los Angeles, the forum has grown especially strong in the last three or four years, almost doubling the number of uh, uh, members, uh, expanding uh, member, the members from different sectors, and I expanding the geographic reach of those members so that we're touching lots more pieces of lots more communities uh, in a productive way. And I haven't even mentioned the quarterly consultation process that uh, PRM now requires about two years ago in our cooperative agreements, PRM required all resettlement agencies to talk to each other every quarter. And initially, uh, if you go back and read the cooperative agreement, that's about as much direction as they gave us. Uh, but since then, we've really developed a system by which we can ha hold a meaningful conversation and get a lot of participation. It's not perfect. None of these things are perfect. Uh, but we're beginning to uh, uh, tackle that issue of cooperation. 
And, and so lastly, I want to tell you about uh, one of the most exciting and innovative ways we, just on our own, not from PRM, no direction from PRM, no direction from ORR, certainly no direction from any of our national headquarters, how we, just here in this community, wanted to get after cooperation in California. Now, given today's front page news about airstrikes in what is now the seventh year of the Syrian, na uh, Syrian national war, uh, civil war, it uh, is probably hard to remember what it was like a few years ago. Uh, but think back, cast your mind back, before there were a million or more asylum seekers in Europe, before Elon Curdy's photo uh, on the beach was on the front page, uh, before the war was a concern uh, to many Americans. Uh, way back when, it was still a concern to us. We knew that the number of refugees were going up. It was a million, it was two million, then it was three million. And you may know also that uh, you know, prior to 2016, virtually none of those refugees were admitted to the United States through the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. But we all, know, we all knew that was going to change. We, had, we were doing advocacy. We were getting a lot of good signals from the administration. And sure enough, some of those refugees began to arrive in 2015, right near the end of fiscal 2015. Now what we did here, in two th beginning in 2012, but really getting uh, uh, more active in, in 13 and 14, is we began to prepare. Now that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I know in retrospect, of course you're going to prepare, but we are organizations that are by nature reactive. Uh, we don't prepare until it's too late. <laughs> this. Uh, we took this opportunity to do something different. We were going to have a brand new population, Syrians. We've never resettled Syrians here. We didn't have networks of uh, Arabic speaking, uh, you know, uh, potential Arabic speaking staff or volunteers. We hadn't worked with uh, mosques. We didn't, we weren't connected to the people we needed to be connected. So long before the first case arrived, we started meeting with people around the community and, and started encouraging others around the state to meet with, with people in the Syrian American community, for instance. And, and so we began to make those connections uh, literally months before that first case in late 2015. I'm, I'm going to assume you're stunned by our forward thinking, uh, <laughs> but, but just wait. We also wanted to do something else. We were doing that in Los Angeles, we, but we wanted to do something else uh, throughout the state. We really wanted to take this opportunity to knit together all 24 agencies. And so uh, we went to the California Endowment, which is a, a very large uh, health foundation here in California, and began to talk with them. They do not fund refugees. They really don't even fund direct service. But this was at a time when the anti-refugee rhetoric was really heating up, and they wanted to do something. And so we developed a program to promote collaboration around the state. And, and what they did is they gave us a grant uh, after lots of discussion uh, to ensure all of the state's uh, resettlement agencies, one, shared information about best practices. So the thing I referred to earlier, if somebody else solved the problem down the street and I would never know about it, well now I'm gonna know about it because we're, we're gonna share it, we're all gonna share. Two, we want to know, they're going to share information about security considerations because there's uh, an increase in hate crimes, refugees are feeling at risk, but also uh, caseworkers are feeling at risk. We, wouldn't, we wanted to know what was going on around the state with respect to security. And then we were going to know uh, what community partners they were working with because a, 
a, a Syrian American uh, uh, legal uh, organization in Sacramento that works with resettlement agencies up there might have information that would help uh, a case that we're dealing with but have no connections on. So we, we wanted to expand the network of social service agencies. And the way we promoted that uh, collaboration was by, what's the obvious way? Giving away money, paying people. This is the first time we were able to provide a financial incentive to encourage resettlement agencies across this state or any other to collaborate with each other. It's never been done before anywhere in the country. Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, we're very proud of it. Now, uh, the process has not been straightforward. It has not been easy. Uh, you've all heard the uh, uh, metaphor, uh, you know, like herding cats. This has been like herding flying insects when all the insects are different, mosquitoes and flies and dragonflies. Uh, so we're not there yet. We have prepared a report. Uh, our preliminary report that uh, has an enormous amount of information about the single population. Uh, again, never been done before. We're about to send out a request for additional information to augment that report. Um, and so we don't know what the last chapter of this is yet. But what we do know is that we've laid the foundation for a more meaningful uh, collaboration among resettlement agencies, not just for Syrians, but for all refugees resettled in the state. Not done yet, uh, so stay, stay tuned uh, and see how we can build on that promise. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, the last speaker on the last panel. Um, I appreciate you all. Um, being here and, and listening to, to everything that we've had to say today. My name is Megan Taylor. I am the Executive Director for Interfaith Refugee and Immigration Service, um, one of the seven resettlement agencies here in Los Angeles. Um, Marty touched on the headquarters. Um, we actually are a little bit extra complicated. We represent three different headquarters. Um, Marty Martin um, works with IRC. IRIS is an affiliate of Church World Service, Episcopal Migration Ministries, and Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. So of those nine national agencies, um, we get three times the headquarters <laughs> requests. Um, but all that aside, um, our mission is to help welcome refugees and immigrants um, that are newly arrived into Los Angeles and help them achieve self-sufficiency um, while they're here. We have um, three main programs within our office. Um, we were established in 2005 with just our refugee resettlement program. Um, in 2010, we opened an immigration legal services program. And in 2013, um, we opened a refugee employment office as well. Um, over the years, we've helped um, just over 10,000 refugees and immigrants through those, um, through those three major programs. So we're proud to have that benchmark. Um, I'm going to assume, since you've heard from UNHCR earlier today, that you've talked about overseas processing. So I'm not going to get into any of that. And um, that's actually just a really different presentation. So I'm going to fast forward. And first, I'm going to talk about um, what it is that we actually do every single day. Um, on the ground working with our refugees. And then I was also asked to talk a little bit, very briefly, about the Central American Minor Program um, here in Los Angeles. So um, unique to Los Angeles, Martin talked about the Latinburg Program um, for Iranian religious minorities. Um, in addition to that, the CAM Central American Program those processes actually start here domestically. They start within our offices by US-based relatives coming to us to file applications for the relatives who are overseas. Um, that initiates the process versus most other refugees coming 
to the United, well, all other refugees coming to the United States start by approaching a UNHCR office and opening a case and starting um, the process there overseas. Um, here, it starts with our office and then it's picked up overseas once we've filed some applications. Um, so we have two of those. Um, once we get their arrival notice, these it's not just filing an application. This is years of work, of completely unfunded work that we do within our offices just to get applications approved for our refugees to be reunited with their relatives here. Um, once we have their approval, we receive an assurance notice that they will arrive in the United States. That's when we really start to prepare things like housing um, and notify US-based relatives um, that their family are finally going to come. Because of the cost of living in Los Angeles, I would say 99% of the work that we do um, are for refugees that are coming to join family members. So it's a family reunification program. Um, unlike most places here in the United States where they may be receiving more refugees who have no friends, no relatives, no ties anywhere in the United States. So that helps us a little bit um, in regard to the housing crisis that we're all very aware of here in LA. Um, but what we do, um, is our program is called Reception and Placement. It's actually quite similar to the Manitoba program that we talked about a little bit. Um, we pick our refugees up at the airport um, with culturally appropriate um, staff and linguistically appropriate staff. We take them to their homes, make sure that they're fully furnished, um, make sure that they have their immediate needs met, that they have just a little bit of cash in their pocket for their initial expenses. Um, and then everything that you can imagine that a refugee would need to start a new life in a new country, we help with. Um, there are some very strict guidelines under the cooperative agreement that we have um, to provide, and it is the bare minimum. <laughs> I'm bare minimum. Um, two home visits, just two. Unless they move, then we have to go see them a, a third time. Um, basic furnishings, appliances, appropriate um, weather appropriate clothing, food typical to the refugees' culture, cultural orientation, um, which covers about 18 different topics about life in the United States, similar to your life skills and your settlement, local laws, um, just life, um, life issues, 18 different topics. We have, we assist with social security cards, um, cash assistance, food assistance, um, enrolling children in school, making sure that refugees go to their health appointments, have access to primary care doctors, um, transportation, um, you name it, ESL, employment services, all within 90 days of their arrival, um, and all for the amount of money that we receive from the State Department to support a refugee for 90 days um, is $1,125. Um, that includes their rent, their furnishing, their food, um, medical needs, education needs, transportation needs. That's it. They call this, it's a public private partnership. Um, but we have a tremendous amount of support from our community. The three agencies, um, national agencies that uh, IRIS is affiliated with are all faith-based networks. Um, we do receive a tremendous amount of support from volunteers um, and what we have, what the, we call welcome teams um, who come together and sponsor or assist, walk alongside refugee families when they arrive. And we really could not do this work without their help um, we only have four case managers. We were expected to resettle 660 refugees this year. Um, and if you can imagine the sprawl of resettlement here in Los Angeles, how difficult it is to simply do a home visit <laughs> for one of our case managers when they have so many other cases that they're handling. So it's been really tremendous um, to have such a supportive community um, especially over the last year. Um, 
Our goal at the end of the resettlement period um, is to, of course, make sure that their income exceeds their expenses, and that balance is always difficult. Um, make sure that they are in safe and what we consider affordable housing here in Los Angeles. Um, but most importantly, that the refugees are connected to and aware of ongoing services that are available to them um, so that they know how to access those services after our initial 90-day period is up. Um, I say it's 90 days, that's what our contract says, it's 90 days, but if you talk to any of the resettlement agencies um, here in Los Angeles or probably anywhere in the country, that relationship goes on for years. Um, our refugees come back to us for years. Um, in celebration, sometimes to show us that they bought their first car, um, and also for their green card after they've been here for one year, or if they're coming back to us to apply for their US citizenship through our legal, legal program. Um, refugees are employment authorized upon arrival. Um, they do um, start working um, as soon as possible, many entry level jobs. We have a very complex mix and a variety of refugees coming here, some that have no or very low literacy levels and some that are highly educated um, professionals from overseas. So employment, um, I know that IRC has a, a match grant program. They also do a lot of employment work is, is always interesting. Um, but our refugees um, do succeed here. It is a challenge. Um, I agree we do need to collaborate more. Um, I do feel like uh, sometimes we are reinvent re reinventing the wheel for, for one another. Um, but that is the majority of our, our work. Um, 90 days, it, it's not easy work, but it's very, very rewarding. Um, but um, two populations that people always ask us to come and talk about are the Syrians and the Central American miners. And it's interesting because we really don't have a lot of them. Um, they're two of our smallest pipelines. Um, and Marty talked about the Syrians. I'm just gonna touch briefly because I know we wanna have time for questions about the Central American Miner Program and what that is and some experiences that we've seen so far. Um, it's a priority two designated refugee group um, it's outside um, country of origin, but inside, inside in-country processing. We file the applications here domestically. It provides a m alternative to the dangerous route that so many Central American children were, the dangerous journey they were making to the United States um, that I'm sure we all read about and heard on the news, especially during 2014. Um, the State Department's response to this was to develop the CAM program. It started December 2014, and it allows for um, minors who have certain um, relatives lawfully present in the United States to be reunited with their children who are in El Salvador, Guatemala, Guatemala and Honduras. Um, if the refugee is approved, the refugee minors approved, they get to come to the United States and receive the reception services that we provide. If they are denied, um, they may be paroled into the United States on humanitarian grounds, and I can get into that in a minute. Um, or they can request for a review of their case. So overseas processing is similar, just like everyone else. Um, all other refugees, they're pre-screened, interviewed. There's a DNA test component. Um, that we help facilitate domestically here in LA. Um, background checks, um, in-country interviews with USCIS officers to determine their eligibility for the refugee program. And if approved, then assigned to us. As of March of this year, na nationwide, since the beginning of this program, only about 11,500 CAM cases um, have been filed, of that number, 25, 2,600 have arrived in the United States, but only about 1,130 have arrived as refugees. So one of our partner organizations, um, Kids in Need of Defense, KIND, has done a little bit of research on why that might be, um, why those numbers are so low. 
Um, here in LA, I'll also note that in 2016, only about 60, 60 or so CAM cases arrived in the United States as refugees. This year, um, it's closer to 80 so far this year, um, most of which are from El Salvador and then Guatemala, a very small number from Honduras. Um, but why is that number so low? Um, I think some of the challenges for the children, it's the length of the process. They have very limited communication with the resettlement support center that's overseas. Um, they don't have any where to check their case status. There's very, very limited support. They don't have attorneys working with them. Um, they have to take numerous trips to the Capitol just to um, <clears throat> move their case along and for their interviews with USCIS and to go for their DNA testing, which is extremely difficult for these kids. Um, for parents here in the US, there's a lack of information. There are very long wait times. Um, there's nowhere to check their case status. The resettlement agencies that are tasked with administering this program, again, it is a completely unfunded program. Um, and where we might have Armenian and Farsi and Arabic throughout our staff, <laughs> believe it or not, it's hard to find Spanish in our offices. Um, so it's, that's, that's a challenge. Um, but the challenge is related to the adjudication of these claims. We're finding that the children really just don't, the minors, um, don't understand really the purpose of the interviews. They're not meeting with attorneys. They're not prepared um, by anyone. Testimony in these USCIS interviews is the only evidence that they can submit. Um, normalization of violence by these children. It's, they, they don't necessarily know what to bring up or what to focus on in their interviews. Um, just a general lack of understanding um, worrying about saying something um, that could get back to their families or that might displease the officers. And they're generally um, only one interview with USCIS and the method of questioning is just very foreign um, to, these, to these minors. The typical claims, refugee claims, that we hear about um, are that children are forced out of school due to gang violence um, gang and gender violence, gang recruitment, um, familial violence, um, extortion of family members based on um, having a relative who's in the United States, um, targeting witnesses to gang, um, gang crimes and violence. Um, when, when our clients are able to make the nexus between their persecution and their story, they might be granted. But one of the things that we're seeing is, we actually in our office had a case recently where the, the brother was granted asylum, but the sister was only granted parole. Um, probably because she just didn't know how to describe her fear, that is her, the shared fear that her brother has. Um, their entire family was a target. But because of that, um, she's not eligible for any of the case management services that we, that we provide in our office. Um, when a case is denied, they're given really no information on the reason for denial. Um, so it makes it very difficult to request for case review. Um, you have two options when you're denied. If you are eligible and granted parole on humanitarian grounds, you might be able to come to the United States, but you have to buy your own plane ticket and medical, um, pay for your own medical clearances. Um, Parole is only for two years. It's not a path towards citizenship. Um, but what it does allow here, at least in California, um, is a driver's license or ID. There are some limited benefits. Um, you do have a right to work. You can file for a work permit. But most importantly, you have that two-year period to seek legal counsel here to file for permanent relief, such as asylum or a T or a U visa or CIGIS. Um, and we're lucky here in Los Angeles to have a number of legal organizations that focus on that work. Um, but again, they don't receive any of our case management assistance. We try to help them as much as we can. Um, but that's that. Our recent um, administrative um, change, you know, we keep wondering this 120 day freeze, is this gonna happen, is this not gonna happen? Um, 
but CAM AORs, we're continuing to file them, um, and they are continuing to request DNA, and they are continuing the processing up until the interview, um, including the pre the pre interview preparation. They are still having us inform our clients that this is happening, and then they'll cancel the U USCIS interview. Also, they have um, halted travel for parolees at this time. Um, so that's, that's also something that um, is quite disappointing um, and frightening. So the state of the CAM program um, is to be determined. The numbers are not great. We again are not funded for this work. I know that the Central American community here in Los Angeles is much larger than the number of cases that we've filed. Um, in, at our office, we've filed about 180 cases, and we've only, and of those, I think I wrote this down, um, 100, 190 cases, 30 have received parole status, cases, not individuals, 30 cases have received parole status, and 25 cases have received refugee status. It's a very um, low, number. Um, so if we can increase our capacity, I think that we can continue to file these, um, but it's not a perfect alternative to, um, to the crisis at our borders. And um, I, think that, I think that that's it. I know I want to give time for questions and answers. So thank you.